Hey, welcome back to the channel, everybody. This is Kevin. And in this week's video, we're gonna take a look at a routing protocol that's an oldie but a goodie. It's RIP, the Routing Information Protocol. Why on earth are we dedicating a video to RIP? The reason is, it shows up on the blueprint of the Network Plus exam from CompTIA, and I'm right now in the middle of creating a new Network Plus video training series, and I thought it would be good to review the concepts of RIP because it gets so little love in the industry, for good reason, but you still need to know how it works. So in this video, we're gonna dive into the theory of RIP, we're gonna talk about the different variants of RIP, RIP version one, version two, NG, we're gonna see how split horizon and point was in reverse work. And if you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, go ahead and click the like button down below and subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now, let's dive into a look at the theory of RIP. One of the dynamic routing protocols you need to know about for the Network Plus exam is RIP which stands for Routing Information Protocol and there are a few different versions I want you to know about. First up is RIP version 1 or RIP v1. By the way, I would not use this on a modern network. I actually did use this on a network at a university way back in the early 1990s, but I would certainly not use it today. It's got some undesirable characteristics. For example, the way it sends out routing information to other routers is through broadcasts. Now remember, a broadcast goes to every device within a subnet or within a broadcast domain. That means when the router says, here's my routing table, I can get to all of these networks, that advertisement goes not just to neighboring routers, it goes to PCs and printers and every other device in that subnet. And to compound that, it happens by default every 30 seconds. It's like me coming up to you and saying, hey, let me read you my resume of everything I know how to do. And I read this resume and I come back 30 seconds later and I do it again and 30 seconds later and I do it again. That's a bit much. And another downside to RIP version one is it does not have what is called VLSM support. For your notes, that stands for variable length subnet masking. What that's telling us is that RIP version one can only advertise classful networks meaning that if we go in and add some bits to a uh, subnet mask to take one network and divide it up into different subnets, if we do that, we cannot advertise those networks that we created by adding bits. We have to advertise at that classful boundary. So let's say you take the 10.1.1.0 network and you've applied a 24-bit subnet mask. If you tell RIP to advertise that, it's going to say, nope. I'm just going to advertise the classful address for a 10 dot network, which has eight bits in the subnet mask. RIP version one also only supports IP version four. Now things did get a lot better with RIP version two. Instead of sending its advertisements everywhere, a RIP version two router is a bit more selective. It's going to use a multicast, which is going to go just to RIP version two speaking routers because those routers join a multicast group with a group address of 224.0.0.9. This version does support variable length subnet masking. It also adds authentication. So you cannot have someone just bring up their own router and start exchanging routes and maybe injecting some false routes. That could happen with RIP version one. But like RIP version one, we still advertise by default our entire network table every 30 seconds and it only supports IP version 4. There is a version that will support the routing of IP version 6, and it's called RIP NG, where NG stands for Next Generation. And if you're a Star Trek Next Generation fan, yes, they did get the name for RIP NG from Star Trek The Next Generation. This will support the routing of IP version 6 and the multicast address that it sends its advertisements out to is the IP version 6 multicast address of FF02 colon colon 9. And the way RIP selects a best path to a network, regardless of which version we're talking about, is through the use of hop count. How many routers do I have to go through, besides myself, to get to this destination network? If a network is directly connected to me, then it's zero hops away. If I have to go through one router to get to that network, it's one hop away. And RIP is not very scalable because it can only go through 15 router hops. It sees 16 router hops as infinity. It's unreachable. And we mentioned that it's going to send out its entire table by default every 30 seconds. That's called a full update. But 
we can have triggered updates. If there is a change in the routing table, we can go ahead and advertise to our neighbors that change to the routing table without waiting for that 30 second interval. And I also want you to know about a couple of protection mechanisms that RIP can use. Split Horizon and Poison Reverse. In fact, let me give you an animation of what that's doing for us. Here we see a fairly simple network. We've got three routers and we're just looking at the routing table of routers R2 and R3. Let's make sure this makes sense to us first of all. Router R2 is directly connected to the 172.16.1.0/24 network. So in R2's routing table, that network shows as zero hops away because we're directly connected. Same thing for the 192.168.1.0/24 network. It's zero hops away. But take a look at 10.1.1.0/24. That was advertised to us by R3. That network is over on the right-hand side of R3. That's where switch SW1 lives. R3 is connected to it, so it's zero hops away from R3. We can see in R3's writing table. But when we advertise it over to R2, R3 says, yep, I'm directly connected. I can get you there. And R2 says, great. My hop count to 10.1.1.0/24 is one hop. I have to hop through R3 to get there. R3's writing table, as we've already said, has a zero hop count or 10.1.1.0/24. It's also directly connected to 172.16.1.0/24, so that's a hop count of 0. And R2 is advertising to R3 that network between R1 and R2, 192.168.1.0/24, so that's one hop away from the perspective of R3. Now, let's say that something horrible happens to SW1. That network goes down, that interface is no longer up on R3, that network is not available. If we did not have the protection mechanisms of things like split horizon and poison reverse, here's what could happen. If router R2 sent out every 30 seconds its entire routing table to all of its neighbors, here's what happens. R2 is going to advertise its routing table over to R3, including the advertisement for 10.1.1.0/24. R2 is going to say to R3, hey, I can get you there, and I'm only one hop away. And R3 says, oh, that's great because I just lost my connection. I'm glad you can get there in one hop, so I'll go through you, and from my perspective, it's two hops. Here's the problem. The reason R2 thought that network was one hop away is because R3 told it it was directly connected to it. And R3 has lost that connectivity. So these routers have a false sense of security right now. And after the advertisement interval for R3 rolls around, it's going to advertise back to R2. It's two hops away from 10.1.1.0. R2 gets that and it says, oh, the guy that was telling me they were one hop away now seems to be two hops away. Okay, that makes me three hops away. And then we advertise that back to R3 and then R3 says, I must be four hops away. And it goes on and on and on until we get up to 16 hops, which is considered to be infinity. To prevent that from happening, RIP can use a mechanism called split horizon. Split horizon is going to say, if I as a router receive a routing advertisement in on a specific interface, I will not advertise that same route out of that interface. In this case, router R2 received the advertisement for 10.1.1.0 slash 24 in on its interface on the right, it's not going to advertise that back out with split horizon in effect. And there's yet another protection mechanism that RIP can use. After that network where SW1 is goes down, R3 is going to say, I've lost connectivity with that network. I'm 16 hops away. Let's take that out of my routing table. But it's going to make sure that R2 no longer relies on it to get to that network. It wants R2 to know that that network is no longer available. So it's going to send a poisoned route advertisement to R2 saying, hey, that network, 10.1.1.0/24, it's 16 hops away. When R2 gets that, it says, uh-oh, 16, in my book, that's infinity. That's unreachable. So R2 is going to remove it from its routing table. That's another way of eliminating that false sense of security where R2 still thinks there's a way to get to 10.1.1.0. And again, that's called poison reverse. That's where a router that knows a network has gone down, it can send an advertisement with an infinite metric to its neighbor for a route that it knows is unreachable. So R3 sent an advertisement to R2 with an infinite metric for 10.1.1.0. And sometimes you might hear RIP called routing by rumor because 
That's really what's happening here. One router tells somebody else what they know, and they tell somebody else what they know. 